Good morning! I wanted to read more last night, but it was so late and my voice just died and then my <laughs> my eyes started going and then my I couldn't like read properly anymore. I was reading it all wrong. <laughs> so yes, I but today's new day is the start of Ramadan and um yes it's going to be I feel it's gonna be a really really beautiful peaceful like healing time this the this next um, month and I'm wishing you all uh, I'm just I'm just sending you all my love and you know may you may you always feel God's grace and mercy and blessings in your life and presence in your life and may you just be showered in like the most surprising the most delightful of of gifts and blessings and like just yeah just all the good stuff so this is the start i don't think this book has many chapters i think it only has like three or something but this is number one it's called the mystery and yes let's dive into it listen to the voices of these women he's two different people i feel like i'm living with dr jekyll and mr hyde he really doesn't mean to hurt me. He just loses control. Everyone else think he's great. I don't know what it is about me that sets him off. He's fine when he's sober, but when he's drunk, watch out. I feel like he's never happy with anything I do. He scared me a few times, but he never touches the children. He's a great father. He calls me disgusting names, and then an hour later, he wants sex. I don't get it. He messes up my mind sometimes. The thing is, he really understands me. Why does he do that? <laughs> These are the words of women who are describing their anxiety and inner conflicts about their relationships. Each of these women knows that something is wrong very wrong but she can't put her finger on what it is every time she thinks she's got her partner figured out that she finally understands what is bothering him something new happens something changes the pieces refuse to fit together each of these women is trying to make sense out of the roller coaster ride that her relationship has become consider Kristen's account when I first met Maury he was the man I dreamed of. It seemed too good to be true. He was charming, funny, and smart, and best of all, he was crazy about me. I opened up to him about hard things I'd been through over the previous few years, and he was so much on my side about it all, and he was so game for doing things. Whatever I wanted to do, he was up for it. The first year or so that we were together was great. I can't say exactly when things started to change, I think it was around the time we started living together. It started with him saying he needed more space. I felt confused because before that, it had always seemed like he was the one who wanted to be together every second. Then he began to have more and more criticisms and complaints. He'd say that I talk on and on and that I'm self-centered. Maybe I am. It's true that I talk a lot. But earlier, it had seemed like he couldn't hear enough about me. He started to say that I wasn't doing anything with my life. I know he has big ambitions, and maybe he's right that I should be more that way, but I'm happy with what I have. And then it was my weight. It started to seem like all the time he was saying that I needed to work out more, that I wasn't watching what I ate. That hurt the most, to tell you the truth. He seemed to want sex less and less often, and if I ever tried to be the one to initiate lovemaking, forget it. We're still together, but I have a feeling he's going to leave me. I just can't seem to live up to what he needs. I'm trying, but he doesn't think so. And now when he's really angry or frustrated, he says things that cut me down. A few days ago, he said, You're a lazy bee just looking for a man to live off of like your mother. I don't get that. I've contributed a lot. I haven't worked the last two years since our baby was born, but I'm getting ready to go back to work soon. I don't think he really meant it, but still. 
He says I've changed a lot, but I'm not always so sure it's me. Sometimes for a few days, he seems like the guy I fell in love with, and I get hopeful. But then he slips away again as being so unhappy with me. I set him off somehow, but I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Kristen was troubled by several questions. What had happened to the man she loved so much? Why was he always putting her down? What could she do to stop his explosions? Why did he think she was the one who had changed? Other women tell stories that are quite distinct from Kristen's, but they feel just as confused as she does. Here's what Barbara describes. Fran is kind of quiet and shy, but he's cute as a button, and I got a crush on him the day I met him. I had to really go after him. It was hard to draw him out. We'd go out and have great talks, and I couldn't wait to see him again. But three weeks would go by, and he'd say he hadn't been feeling well, or his sister was in town, or whatever. A couple times he forgot dates we had. Well, he finally opened up. Turned out he'd been really hurt before. He'd been cheated on a lot, and women had done some pretty mean things to him. He was afraid to get close again. Little by little, he came around, but I was definitely the pursuer. I tried to show him that I wasn't like other women he'd been with. I'm not flirtatious. I don't show my body off to other men. I'm just not that style, but Fran wouldn't believe it. He'd always say that I was making eyes at a man at the next table, or that I was checking someone out who walked past us. I feel bad for him. He's so insecure. His mother cheated on his father when he was growing up, so I guess that's made it even worse. I was eager to get married because I thought then he'd feel secure that I was his. But he was very reluctant to commit. When we finally did tie the knot, he was more trusting for a while, but then the jealousy came back and it's never left. I've asked him off and on for years to go see a therapist, but he gets really mad and says there's nothing wrong with him. A few days ago, we went to a birthday party for a friend of his, and I had this great conversation with his friend's brother. It was nothing but talking. I mean, the guy isn't even cute. Well, suddenly Fran was saying that we had to go home because he had a bad headache. On the drive home, turned out the real reason was jealousy. He started yelling at me, saying he was sick of me, humiliating him in front of other people, strutting your stuff, and on and on. He was pounding his fist on the dashboard, and two or three times he shoved me up against the car door. Each time that I told him it wasn't true, he would go through the roof, so I stopped saying that. Our children were sitting in the back seat. It scared the daylights out of them. At my age, it's hard to think about leaving him. Starting all over now seems so hard. I just wish he'd get some help. Barbara was struggling with issues different from Kristen's. Why couldn't Fran trust her, and why was he isolating her from other people? Why couldn't he see that he had a problem and get help? Was he going to hurt her badly someday? Would her life ever get better? At first look, Maury and Fran sound nothing like each other. One is young, popular, energetic, and assertive. The other socially awkward, passive, and easily hurt. Fran is physically violent sometimes, whereas Maury's not. But are they as different as they seem? Or do they both actually have the same set of issues underneath the surface, driving their behavior? These are some of the questions for which we will find answers in the chapters ahead. Consider one more account from Laura. Paul's a great guy, dated for about six months, and now we've been living together for several more. We're engaged. I feel so bad for him. His ex-wife accused him of abusing her, and it's a total lie. He made one mistake, which is that he cheated on her, and she's determined to get him back for that. She'll stop at nothing. Now she's even saying that he was violent, claiming he slapped her a few times and broke her things. That's ridiculous. I've been with him for over a year now, and I can tell you, he's nothing like that. Paul has never even raised a hand to me. In fact, he's tried to help me get my life together and has been really there for me. I was in a bad place when I met him. I was depressed. I was drinking too much. And I'm doing so much better now because of him. I hate that B for accusing him of those things. We're going to work together on getting custody of his kids because she's out of control. Laura wondered how Paul's ex-wife could accuse such a delightful man of abuse. She was so angry about it that she didn't notice several warning signs about her own relationship with Paul. 
If Kristen, Barbara, and Laura were to sit down together and compare notes, they might decide that their partners can be more different. The personalities of the three men seem miles apart, and their relationships follow very separate paths. Yet Maury, Fran, and Paul actually have far more in common than meets the eye. Their moodiness, their excuses, their outlook are all bubbling from the same source, and all three are abusive men. The Tragedy of Abuse Abuse of women in relationships touches an unimaginable number of lives. Even if we leave aside caught, uh, cases of purely verbal and mental abuse and just look at physical violence, the statistics are shocking. Two to four million women are assaulted by their partners per year in the United States alone. The U.S. Surgeon General has declared that attacks by male partners are the number one cause of injury to women between the ages of 15 and 44. The, the American Medical Association reports that one woman out of three will be a victim of violence by a husband or boyfriend at some point in her life. The emotional effects of partner violence are a factor in more than one-fourth of female suicide attempts and are a leading cause of substance abuse in adult women. Government statistics indicate that 1,500 to 2,000 women are murdered by their partners and ex-partners per year, comprising more than one-third of all female homicide victims and that these homicides almost always follow a history of violence, threats, or stalking. The abuse of women sends shockwaves through the lives of children as well. Experts estimate that 5 million children per year witness an assault on their mothers, an experience that can leave them traumatized. Children exposed to violence at home show higher rates of school behavior or attention problem problems. Aggression, substance abuse, depression, and many other measures of childhood stress. Abuse of women has been found to be a cause of roughly one-third of divorces among couples with children and one-half of divorces where custody is disputed. As alarming as this picture is, we also know that physical assaults are just the beginning of the abuse that women may be subjected to. There are millions more women who have never been beaten, but who live with repeated verbal assaults, humiliation, sexual coercion, and other forms of psychological abuse, often accompanied by economic exploitation. The scars from mental cruelty can be as deep and long-lasting as wounds from punches or slaps, but are often not as obvious. In fact, even among women who have experienced violence from a partner, Half or more repeat reports that the man's emotional abuse is what's causing them the greatest harm. The differences between the verbally abusive man and the physical batterer are not as great as many people believe. The behavior of either style of abuser grows from the same roots and is driven by the same thinking. Men in either category follow similar processes of change in overcoming their abusiveness, if they do change, which unfortunately is not common. And the categories tend to blur. Physically assaultive men are also verbally abusive to their partners. Mentally cruel and manipulative men tend to gradually drift into using physical intimidation as well. In this book, You'll meet abusers on a spectrum ranging from those who never use violence to those who are terrifying. The extent of their common ground may startle you. One of the obstacles to recognizing chronic mistreatments in relationships is that most abusive men simply don't seem like abusers. They have many good qualities, including tons of kindness, warmth, and humor, especially in the early period of a relationship. An abuser's friends may think the world of him. He may have a successful work life and have no problems with drugs or alcohol. He may simply not fit anyone's image of cruel or intimidating person, 
So when a woman feels her relationship spinning out of control, it's unlikely to occur to her that her partner is an abuser. The symptoms of abuse are there, and the woman usually sees them, the escalating frequency of put-downs, early generosity turning more and more to selfishness, verbal explosions when he's irritated or when he doesn't get his way, her grievances constantly turned around on her so that everything is her own fault, his growing attitude that he knows what's good for her better than she does, and in many relationships, a mounting sense of fear or intimidation. But the woman also sees that her partner is a human being who can be caring and affectionate at times. She loves him. She wants to figure out why he gets so upset so that she can help him break his pattern of ups and downs. She gets drawn into the complexities of his inner world, trying to uncover clues, moving pieces around in an attempt to solve an elaborate puzzle. The abuser's mood changes are especially perplexing. He can be a different person from day to day or even from hour to hour. At times he's aggressive and intimidating, his tone harsh, insults spewing from his mouth, ridicule dripping from him like oil from a drum. When he's in this mode, nothing she says seems to have an impact on him, except to make him even angrier. Her side of the argument counts for nothing in his eyes, and everything is her fault. He twists her words around so that she always ends up on the defensive. As so many partners of my clients have said to me, I just can't seem to do anything right. At other moments, he sounds wounded, and lost, hungering for love and for someone to take care of him. When this side of him emerges, he appears open and ready to heal. He seems to let down his guard, his hard exterior softens, and he may take on the quality of a hurt child, difficult and frustrating but lovable. Looking at him in this deflated state, his partner has trouble imagining that the abuser inside him will ever be back. The beast that takes him over at other times looks completely unrelated to the tender person she now sees. Sooner or later, though, the shadow comes back over him, as if it had a life of its own. Weeks of peace may go by, but eventually she finds herself under assaults once again. Then her head spins with the arduous effort of untangling the many threads of his character until she begins to wonder whether she's the one whose head isn't quite right. To make matters worse, everyone she talks to has a different opinion about the nature of his problem and what she should do about it. Her clergy person may tell her, love heals all difficulties. Give him your heart fully and he will find the spirit of God. Her therapist speaks a different language, saying, He triggers strong reactions in you because he reminds you of your father, and you said things off in him because of his relationship with his mother. You each need to work on not pushing each other's buttons. A recovering alcoholic friend tells her, He's a rage addict. He controls you because he's terrified of his own fears. You need to get him into a 12-step program. Her brother may say to her, He's a good guy. I know he loses his temper with you sometimes, he does have a short fuse, but you're no prize yourself with that mouth of yours. You two, you two need to work it out for the good of the children. And then, to crown her increasing confusion, she may hear from her mother or her child's school teacher or her best friend, he's mean and crazy and he'll never change. All he wants is to hurt you. Leave him now before he does something even worse. All of these people are trying to help, and they are all talking about the same abuser. But he looks different from each angle of you. The woman knows from living with the abusive man that there are no simple answers. Friends say his mean, but she knows many ways in which he's been good to her. Friends say he treats you that way because he can get away with it. I would never let someone treat me that way. But she knows that the times when she puts her foot down the most firmly, he responds by becoming his angriest and most intimidating. When she stands up to him, he makes her pay for it, sooner or later. 
Francais leave him, but she knows it won't be that easy. He'll promise to change. He'll get friends and relatives to feel sorry for him and pressure her to give him another chance. He'll get severely depressed, causing her to worry whether he'll be all right. And, depending on what style of abuser he is, she may know that he will become dangerous when she tries to leave him. She may even be concerned that he will try to take her children away from her, as some abusers do. How is an abused woman to make a sensible picture out of this confusion? How can she gain enough insight into the causes of this problem to know what path to choose? The questions she faces are urgent ones. Five puzzles. Professionals who specialize in working with abusive and controlling men have had to face these same perplexing issues at work. I was a co-director of the first counseling program in the United States and perhaps in the world for abusive men. When I began leading groups for abusers 15 years ago, they were as much of a mystery to me as they are to the woman they live with. My colleagues and I had to put a picture together from the same strange clues faced by Kristen, Barbara, and Laura. Several themes kept confronting us over and over again in our client stories, including his version of the abuse is worlds apart from hers. A man named Dale in his mid-30s gave the following accounts when he entered my group for abuse of men. My wife Maureen and I have been together for 11 years. The first 10 years we had a good marriage and there was no problem with abuse or violence or anything. She was a great girl. Then about a year ago she started hanging around she started hanging around with this bee she met named Eleanor who really has it in for me. Some people just can't stand to see anyone else happy. This girl was single and was obviously jealous that Maureen was in a good marriage, so she set out to wreck it. Nobody can get along with Eleanor, so of course she has no relationships that last. I just had the bad luck that she ran into my wife. So this bee started started planting a lot of bad stuff about me in Maureen's head and turning her against me. She tells Maureen that I don't care about her, that I'm sleeping with other girls, all kinds of lies. And she's getting what she wants because now Maureen and I have started having some wicked fights. This past year we haven't gotten along at all. I tell Maureen I don't want her hanging around with that girl, but she doesn't listen to me. She sneaks around and sees her be behind my back. And look, I'm not here to hide anything. I'll tell you straight out, it's true that two or three times this year, I finally couldn't take all the accusations and yelling anymore, and I've hauled off and slapped her. I need help, I'm not denying it. I have to learn to deal with the stress better. I don't want her to get me arrested. And maybe I can still figure out how to persuade Maureen not to throw a great thing away, because at the rate we're going, we'll be broken up in six months. I always interview the partner of each of my clients as soon as possible after he enrolls in the program. I reached Maureen by phone several days later and heard her account. Dale was great when I first met him, but by the time we got married, something was already wrong. He'd gone from thinking I was perfect to constantly criticizing me, and he'd get in such bad moods over the littlest, littlest of things. I wouldn't be able to figure out how to get him to feel better. Only a couple months after the wedding, he shoved me for the first time. And after that, some explosion would happen about two or three times a year. Usually, he'd break something or raise a fist, but a few times he shoved me or slapped me. Some years he didn't do it at all and I'd think it was all over, but then it happened again. It sort of came in waves. And he was always, always putting me down and telling me what to do. I couldn't do anything right. Anyhow, about a year ago, I made a new friend, Eleanor. She started telling me that what Dale was doing was abuse, even though he'd never punched me or injured me, and that I hadn't done anything to deserve it. At first, I thought she was exaggerating because I've known women that got it so much worse than me. And Dale can be really sweet and supportive when you least expect it. We've had a lot of good times, believe it or not. Anyhow, Eleanor kind of opened my eyes up, so I started standing up to Dale about how he talks to me and told him I was thinking of moving out for a while. 
And what's happened is that he's gone nuts. I swear something has happened to him. He's backhanded me twice in the last eight months. And another time he threw me over a chair and my back went out. So I finally moved out. For now, I'm not planning to get back with him, but I guess it depends partly on what he does in the abuser program. Oh my goodness. Notice the striking contrasts. Dale describes the first 10 years of his marriage as abuse-free, while Maureen remembers put-downs and even physical assaults during those years. Maureen says that Eleanor helps and supports her, while Dale sees her as corrupting Maureen and turning her against him. Dale says that they're still together, while Maureen reports that they've already broken up. Each one thinks the other has developed a problem. How can their perceptions clash so strongly? In the chapters ahead, we will explore the thinking of abusive men to answer the question of why Dale's view contains such serious distortions.